equally good at just setting that kind of, you know, big team fight ultimate, maybe try and find a back line with the hop, and it looks like it's going to be on LDLC to be the proactive ones, to find something going for them either in mid or in top, or like we said in the last game, getting that Yumi on top of that Zinzou and moving around the map to get advantage. Now, before that chase was locked in, I thought LDLC would have a really hard time again as soon as you start grouping more people together. Now, you actually do have a range advantage, which is really difficult oh, yeah. to get over a misfortune that is it because they're that long range, but now you have the accelerator shock blast. There's no sustain on the other side to really deal with that as well. Yeah, you got an eclipse on the misfortune at some point, but it's not really going to work when you're in river. You don't have a minion wave to start heading up on. And if you ever slip once in the grouped up fights now as Kami Core, that W from Jin lands. The shock blast lands. A lot of burst follows up. I think LDLC have a lot of good pick as soon as you start putting pieces together. That's the thing. They need to be the, on the objective and try, you know, poke them down before the fight even starts. So they come to a point where it's like, well, we're too low HP to actually fight this one. We'll just have to forfeit the objective instead. And even Ike will be able to do that on, that on the LeBlanc. W for Q R E that poke in itself, right? You never have to be the you never have to one shot them. You just have to make sure that they're not in a position to take the fight. Yeah, and that's the big thing as well. Yes, you have a lot of poke, you've a lot of range available to you on the side of LDLC, but you aren't the masters of your own engage. You're kind of waiting to see what comes in on top of you and if you can survive it. But in fairness to them, yes, they lost in game two. They were able to find some decent points of the fights where they were able to kind of survive that initial engage, survive the, the range advantage that you have with the Azir and the Misfortune and still come out on top. Now, now to kind of phrase it fairly to LDLC, again, they were still ahead in that second game. Even with all of these factors working against them, I said, actually, typically as a team, LDLC, they don't like X, Y, Z. Maybe this is bad for them. They were still very much in a position to have won that game and it got very, very close around the Elder fight. Now, in this game, I think that LDLC have to play a very different style of League of Legends. Again, it's more poke. I think if you get vision around the area of the objective as well, someone is walking to it. Someone like an Azir, they get caught by a Jin W, they are in a massive amount of threat. You can hop over walls. I think that LDLC are going to have to show a lot of different skill sets we haven't seen from this competi uh, com uh, competition yet. Look how much prior they're putting onto Ragnar in the early game though here. They come up with Yumi, they place a pink board, because Yumi doesn't really have to buy potions either way, and now he's got, you know, facilitation in the early game. That means Yike can even go red buff and go out on top lane immediately just to come in with a cheesy level 2 gang if that's what he wants. And we gotta talk about this top lane as well. Both games, we saw these two top laners kind of taking themselves apart, you know, to be the to be the boss, to be the final raid master of these particular teams. And for Ragnar versus Cabo Shard, it has just been about them facilitating the the team and what they want to do as a team. And again, we've talked a lot about these bot lanes in regards to the rest of the map. And you can see right there, jungle proximity, large amount of pressure for Cabo Shard from his jungler. Also happens from support. Hans Hero makes their way up there. Both of these players are so very important to their teams. Wait to see exactly where they want to try and focus out now as LDLC. There we see both junglers on the bot side here as uh, 113 and Yike have out. Both had fairly decent early games when they were both on the jar, but I'm curious to see where 113 does go because no real vision was actually established by either team to be aggressive. So both teams are kind of in a little bit of a blind spot when it comes to the junglers. But let's try and, you know, go back to what we saw as well in, in, in just the second game as well, where we saw the matchup with the LeBlanc into the ACM. Remember, Ica was actually really good at being the one getting that priority. And with this priority, well, well, let's try and fast forward that a little bit. Let's try and predict once you have that mid lane priority, once you can build that up towards the top side, where, you know, it's already dropped the pink ward, you will have your jungler pathing up towards the top side as well. You might just be looking for wave three, wave four play on the top side to see if you can pro Cabo out of the game uh, so early into uh, which was what we saw in the first game. Ooh, early all in. Ooh, they have to flash away there, and that's kind of what we wanted to expect to see from Hantera. Again, very aggressive on this. Rakan wants to try and get those early summers out. You need to do this versus Yumi. You need to start punishing level one, level two before there are multiple points coming through, and you have a lot of power from something like an Ignite to force an all in. I'm not sure it achieves that much here, though. I'm actually so surprised that I see that 113 is pathing up towards that top side. I think it can only be to Shadow Cabochon in the beginning to kind of stop them from going on a dive there initially. Because once again, we see how difficult this bot lane is to play. That's why I highlighted it in Champ Select 2. Because you make one mistake, you're dead. And now, Exekick, he doesn't have that flash. So oh, 113, they spot him. if he disrupt this, get the reset through, moves down towards the bottom side, they are in a really good position on K-Corp. Okay, Cabo doesn't have Rage. Mid lane is in priority for Saken. I guess to push it in. So 1-1-3 uh, does the full clear, gets that one scuttle. And if Yike goes up towards the, those Krugs, of course, I mean, that bot lane doesn't have that flash. I'm not sure LDLC would really want to fight towards a bot scuttle. No, they do not want to fight towards it. Ike just taking a favorable trade into Saken, recognizing there isn't a lot, if any at all, mana on top of this Azir. So able to take that one there. 1-1-3 is... Uh, 
Burning straight down towards his bot side, so he wants to try and make something work out to Exit Kick, who does not have Flash, but this is smart from LDLC's bot lane. They know they can't really push this far forward, and they have to back away. Yeah, so at least they get the crash. I was wondering if that wave state was a potential freeze for K uh, for Reckless and Hantara. Luckily, they are able to get the crash through from Exit Kick, and Dust that allows them to get a favorable reset, and the wave state won't be too messy for them. If they had been stopped there, their lane would have been really disastrous. And actually, both of these bot lanes throughout this one have been doing those uh, those quirky um, bot lane shenanigans. Well, uh, the what they'll fake a recall, they'll shove it in, or they'll have the support just walk up and uh, start um, proxying that way. Not proxying it, but you know, they'll start holding it at a certain exactly. point outside the town. Both of these lanes have done that. They're both wise to each other's tricks. Tara, though, yeah. this is early roaming, and he can W over the wall, come through from the tri bush if he wants to. Not gonna opt into it. Obviously, it would be a bit dangerous if you just. W in and yikes on the other side, right? Uh, but outside of that, once again, displaying how heavy they value getting Hantara on the map and specifically on the Rakan pick. And in this TV2 as well, I mean, you leave the Misfortune alone against the Zero, I mean, you're not going to have a Leona or a Nautilus hooking that Misfortune, putting them into a lot of threat. It's more than okay for them to do this in the TV2. And one of my issues with picking the Yumi up for LDLC is actually, again, we talked about it so much in game one, which LDLC really ended up smashing out. Yike and Doss has been so important for this team. The Yumi stops them playing around that quite as much. Now, it does have a lot of value in those team fights. don't get me wrong. I just think for LDLC, you need to play the early game so much more differently without DOS being on a big roaming champion. You're right, and that difference obviously has to come through some skirmishing through Yike as well. They never really accelerated the dueling potential you get into a job, and they never really invaded on Raptors either with the Yumi, with the LeBlanc as well. So I feel like if you want to make this kind of pick combo work with Yumi and, and, and Sensao here, well, you, you have to start skirmishing. You have to get ahead of the opponent's jungler. And this is what he's trying to do right now, to Sneaking himself into some alcove gameplay. Sitting himself nice and snugly in between those two walls as this wave has just been pushed in. It is just kind of a hover right now, expecting 113 to kind of be in a position, but they are starting to push a little bit further ahead as 113 finally puts himself now towards this bot side. Yike will be revealed as uh, the Jarvan and him cross paths and Execute backs himself away. But the response is there immediately for 113, and they don't get the crash. Now the threes is there outside of the bot line lane. It's a Karen with minion as well, which really puts Execute in an unfavorable position where he'll just have to forfeit minion waves. This entire wave now, it's no longer his. And Reckless by default, because of minion paro, because of the lane matchup, just gets an advantage. And again, just speaking about LDLC, in the few flaws they really have shown, remember, they were undefeated up until that last game, but there were a couple of worries when the, when the game became very bot lane centric when there was a lot of impact put down there when there was a lot of ability to play oh. around those tricky lane states they're Big gonna trade. get a lot of damage here ragnar will be able to trade it back though into his range form one more auto attack oh. from either of these top laners would have done it neither using their flash yike is here though and 113 is not cabochard is trying to heal up as much as he can he's exhausted for a little bit so won't be able to get up his mega it's a bit of a weird one right now. You, you know don't... it's coming. It knows it's oh, coming. Oh, hits. the accelerated shock blast does land. Ragnar's trying to see if he can make something work for himself. He's trying to see if they can get on top of him. The good flash, the knock up is good. Yeah, he can't finish it, but Ragnar can. And that's first blood going up to the top side. And that is so important, but what can one three clean up? No, he can't. Execute. Can... Yeah, execute is good. Execute and execute. And that's going to be 113 finding literally nothing right now. Santera feels like he can get something going from side on the bot side. They drop down the Night, but Doss is there just to absorb so much of that damage. It is very big, though, that there's nothing actually retained by Carmine Core on that top side. They don't get to clean anything up. There's no extra goal going into that Jarvan. And, and now with that Jace getting far ahead, we brought up, you know, the whole thing about this top lane. Kabashar being so dominant in that last game. Game before that, Ragnar on the side, so important to their team. In this game, with the Jace getting ahead of the Gnar early on, getting a kill, getting to crash a wave, it's huge value for LDLC. Yeah, and it's exactly what they wanted. We knew it from the get-go when we walked in. That pink wall dropped, that pathing from the bot side going up there as well. And from Capo, a ah, little bit too over-aggressive. You win a really good trade, like the trading pattern initially is so good. If you could get a recall where the wave state will kind of just by default stop out of sight of your turret, you'd be great. But he wanted to go in for it. He saw the potential solo kill, and because of that, well, he gets punished while Yike finally comes around. And this is just a very unfortunate. I feel like if he, he probably survives if this accelerated shock blast does not he gets land. Close. It gets very, very, very close. very close right there, because you can see how low everyone goes, and he almost outplays it, but I gotta love the fact that Yike had got that knock up, already prepped and primed, and was ready to try and go in, so he knew as soon as he got on top of him, he was dead. Yeah, actually uses the auto attack on the tower to start priming that three talent strike, the Q, and gets out with enough time, and 113 just has to watch and go, ah, 
seconds away from getting a huge advantage for topside. But despite that, it is actually KCOP securing the Rift Herald, and that is something you would have loved on LDLC. If you could have accelerated your side lane leads with Shelly here, would have been absolutely pivotal. But now with mid lane priority, Saken hovering on the left side of the map, KCOP as well with Rift Herald, could just employ this on the topside if they'd like to. So what was... Oh no! Oh, I was just about to talk about that pink ward surviving so long. Actually, I believe it was Ragnar who actually replaced it. So it wasn't the original pink ward. I was baited though, south there, but mid lane. Um, I can take some hard trades with Hantera uh, taking a field trip once again outside of his lane. Well, we're going to see some hard trades on the top side here as there goes the Cataclysm there. Cabal Shard not quite in Mega and they can't really dive this one just yet. Yike doesn't have the flash. He does get the Tree Talon strike. They don't land the Boomerang to get the reset here and Cabal Shard's just dead. Nothing he can do and this is starting to become a bit of a theme right now of Carmian Corp just overextending. Yeah, exactly. Another overextension from Cabal Shard. They didn't have the roaming coming through from Hantera up to the top side. He was in the mid lane trying to facilitate that. Oh, oh the chain. Oh, they're going to get a double knock up here into another double knock up as Dawson Yike need to try and back themselves away. Ike will get a chain down to stop Saken from joining the party. And this is starting to get a little bit scrappy here, Nymera. Those are some really clutch chains, though. You may, you miss one of them suddenly. Carmen Core maybe feel emboldened to not fight around him. However, they do enough work <laughs> to stop the Herald going forward. This is all getting a little bit dicey here. They will only get two plates and, and it goes straight. Both go yeah. to one, one, three. That is so annoying. That is so annoying. Here we go. They're going to get the flash out of Ike, but they get the ult traded back from Saken. It was Ignite from DOS. And again, it's just very scrappy coming out here from both teams. Lots of someone to burn there, but they don't actually secure the kill. So Saken, all he had to do, use the ultimate, and he's fine. Definitely a worth scenario. This time around, though, the Drake, it's been taking a while for them to secure this objective. We're 10 minutes into the game. Usually, we would see it be contested at around the six to seven minute era. This time around for both teams, haven't really been a priority. And it just speaks to how much the top lane has been about this game. And you think back to other LeBlancs we see in the series and, and these kind of compositions where you don't have uh, an Aphelios, a Zaya, something which really scales up. LDLC are on a point where they do actually value that gold over those neutral objectives. Now, Jace is a bit of a weird factor in that because Jace always loves stacking st uh, stack dragons. You force them to come to the objective. Jace pokes you out with those oh, yeah. item spikes. But in this particular game, I mean, I think LDLC are very happy with just getting some wins around topside. I think that's uh, something that they were very, uh, it was very important for them to get and they've managed to achieve that. Now we start to see some more shifts coming around. We do have the turbo chem tank being finished up here by 113, so he's got some decent tanky sats to him, but it is equaled on the other side by Ragnar on that Eclipse. So they are pushing this one in. They will get Hantera and Seika back over the wall. And that's the final chapter down. So we're seeing a lot of very, very different from game one and even game two, where there was an awful lot more structured 5v5s. It's more seems to be odd number skirmishes coming around the, all these different But at least they're trying around it this time around. This is something we didn't see in the first game. Now the execution is not really hitting, but this is how you want to play it. But it just speaks to the good disruption you see from K-Corp as well. They immediately, as a unit, both just use their mobility and dashes to get into the pit and get out of the scrap. And uh, it's really sad that they didn't quite get that uh, final chapter down onto both of those uh, very, very high mobility champions. Reckless uh, throwing that all on top of 10. Sadly takes aggro. Maybe would have been able to force X kick a little off and <laughs> trading ultimates. Trading ultimates. One lands. Will he get the fourth? He will not. That's just going to be a little bit of trade, but important to notice, Exekick did lose his heal off of that, so a tool not available, and Dragon's still yet to be started, or just yet. And it's another wave and another period of play which the Jace has been protected in, because Jace, even when you get individual advantages, can always be shut down. Hasn't yeah. reached that two item spike yet. When he gets really annoying, is when he just one shots you when you try and go onto him. It's Usually not three. Yeah, when you get to those three items, you think, okay, that's a little bit difficult. Not nearly at that point yet, though. And most of the time, LDLC do this for their mid lane, right? Again, they protect the mid lane very well. In this game, it's been that top lane. They're showing those transferable skill shots, uh, skill uh, skill sets. And they're just making sure Cabo Shard's having a really bad time. Cabo Shard is kind of needs to back away from this. He had no vision to see if they actually came in on top of this. And they know he didn't walk away. He actually just TP back to the lane. 113 finally recognizing that something's going on. Cabo trying to get up to his mega as soon as he possibly can. And LDLC recognized they do not want anything to do with this fight. But they get the plating once again, and they get the pre pressure from Ragnar, and they can do this. They're not getting punished on any other side of the map. Yikes, still up a level as well against 113, which is what we wanted to see in Cabo. Oh no, mate, you're not going to be no. extending again, right? Oh, final chapter comes out. He gets locked in. They will get the knock back. Can he keep, keep himself alive? He cannot, and the teleport comes out from Saken as well. Carmen Carp, you got to dot your I's. You got to cross your T's. And you can't even look to respond to that. You think, oh, we've burned some flashes. Well, yeah, they're still full HP. They still have a Yumi. They still got the Crescent Guard. No ability to really play around this. And the more these fights happen, the more 
more thing. This just gets better and better for LDLC. Now, Dizir is going to be a problem later on to the game. Yeah, the Misfortune is going to be a problem, but with the Jace getting all of this gold, with Cabo, who was a big part of Calming Core in that last game, being 0 3, it just feels like it's starting to get very difficult for Calming Core. Well, issue though, right? Because we already talked about the range discrepancy that there is in this matchup. The Shock Blast to come through, the Poke as well from Ica. It's going to be very difficult for Reckless to set up a proper engage to come through. Some of that will come through the creativity we often see from Saking on the ASEAN 113. But once again, if LDLC plays it correctly and they are playing around the range, well, they should be in a more favorable position come these fights. Finally, LDLC finally saying, look, we can take some time. Now the plates are gone to look towards this dragon. But even then, 113 still there. And Ow. <laughs> it's a lot of damage. They will land Reckless onto the stone. He does have a bit of movement speed. Will miss two, oh, no. three. And possibly a fourth shot will go completely awry. And now with the dragon down, it does go over the side of LDLC. It was a delaying ultimate. I love the theory crafting here. Oh, it was a little bit of a delay. <laughs> I like your optimism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go, you know what? Not a lot's happened, so I'm gonna go with you on this one, Nightmare. I'm gonna keep a blind optimism and how that one works. Oh, teleport behind. Let's get some action in, boys. Let's make it happen. They're gonna try and look for it here. I can needs to be careful, though. He's gonna get jumped on straight away, and he's gonna get taken into his passive already. They don't have a gin ultimate, so they can't go for a long range engage. Exa Kick will have to use his flash to keep himself safe. The bullet time is good. The charm almost lands onto the key carries, but Antara dies. And while that's been happening on the picture and picture, Cabo Shark gets a solo kill. How in the hell does Cabo get a solo kill on the top side when he's died three times and Rack has been getting oh, all the reasons? Oh, no. oh, thank God he flashed. He's all right. He's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. They will eventually get the reset off here. And that's the power of the Yumi. Doesn't matter how low Ika goes in, he's going to be able to come back. And we went from very quiet. Let's talk about the fairy crafting the optimism to, okay, let's throw everything in the kitchen sink at them. Okay, so we talked about Chase is still easy to shut down until he gets to one shot you. This is level 11. It's still the second tier of the ultimate. Not has such high base damages, particularly in that mega. And then gets the chase down and. Ragnar walks into a brush without vision, and that's all it takes sometimes to just shut down a Jace. Jace is a very difficult champion to pilot, even from ahead. You need to be so respectful. Ragnar just lets it slip for one moment. That's the thing. Essentially, right out, especially after the changes coming through, he's still a you know range champion. Those space that's yes, they favor the melee, but you're building full lethality. You get matched up against the now with Trinity Force. Those that, that damage, it will just start to come through. We're waiting for that three item power spike before he really becomes a menace, and then once again, K Corp somehow manages to sneak away a Rift Hell on the top side, despite LDLC being the one who's really come out ahead on the skirmishes on this side of the map. The important thing is, as you said, they did come out on the skirmishes up until that solo kill on top, sadly. Easy, easy to skirmish so, yeah. if it's only two people. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's still a skirmish. It's still a skirmish, but it does mean that you have the full control. You can see the vision control there for Carmine Corp. Meant they felt very confident going for that objective. You even have the level 11 for Reckless. That means that his bullet time is going to be shredding through people. And now you're going to start making work onto Hantera, who's going to lose his... Ow. Excuse me, he's going to lose his uh, stopwatch, and now with the Rift Hell being put onto top lane, I actually don't think this will get a charge off because you got everyone here. Yeah, they're going to have to burn this one down. Ooh, You're not going to be able to get sad. it. That's really sad because that would have either taken that top lane turret. We know that again. Chase, even though they're dying, have a lot of gold put into them. Could have also been an easy route into mid. I am actually looking to trade on the notes of that, but uh, coming core. At least going to be able to take the mid out. So it's not the best trade for them losing that Herald, but at least they still start to open up the map and it gives them the ability to group up a bit more now. And I love how even this game is in terms of the team's different win condition, right? On the top side, I was LDLC coming out on top. Cabochard obviously being a little more of a threat after he got that solo kill and has started to push in on the top side as well. But it's just like the game in gold is so even and it's come on different things like Reckless down towards the bot side getting priority, mid lane seeking with the first Herald charts getting it. And it's just blow for blow, and punch for punch, hit for hit, whatever synonym, synonym you want to throw in there. But it, this time around, k -Cop, they should be able to break the top turret. And it comes down to execution. We talked about this last time as well. It's like, yes, you've got different tools available to you, but it's how you execute with those tools there. We're going to see Carmine Corp take away the, dra uh, excuse me, the dragon, the top lane turret, and then back themselves away. They know they're at a pretty powerful spike, and they're trying to make the most out of that. And the spike is happening at a very even point in the game, and... I do think LDLC have largely been uh, the best team in this tournament at playing around. Very specific spikes for their teams. But this oh, is yeah. the finals. Things change in a finals best of five. They especially change when you're up against the back-to-back -back champions of said finals in Kamin Court. You know, I, I was one of these people that doubted them pretty much most of the event. I thought players, they were looking a bit shaky. Groups, they had a lot of those problems again. But they've continued to build and coming to these finals. It's feeling very close. But it also goes down to the level of players we have here, right? You know, we got veterans coming through and it seems like they kind of just evolved with the stage 
stage of the tournament as well. And I, I know an issue for them in the beginning as well, and why LFL was so tricky for them, was that it was motivational issues. Like a player like Reckless, who's been sitting in a studio, all of a sudden he's sitting at home playing a game that has high stakes, but it's really difficult to get into the mindset that it does have these high stakes. Now you finally get into one of the bigger tournaments. Now you get to European Masters, you start playing the finals, and you start feeling that motivation to do well, to get yourself back in the LEC, which for a lot of these players in K-Corp, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and that's the big thing as well. I think K-Corp, again, they're not an academy roster. They are not a team that's looking to, quote-unquote, develop no, behind the a second jewel. team. This is, this is their grand jewel. This is where they want to make their bread and butter as they make their way down towards this bot side. Aika, very slippery, but is starting to run down a little bit on the Seiken. And Seiken, honestly, throughout this main event, has gone... Okay, with people like Cabo Shard and Reckless that you mentioned, Seiken has been someone that I've just been keeping my eye on so much because on this Azir specifically, he's been able to pump out absolutely ridiculous damage numbers. He might be able to do some of that coming up to a fight in here. Yike, trying to predict something or other coming out of that, but uh, just eating some skill shots for it. But for me, last last tournament, I actually thought Cabo Shard was very much my player of the tournament before the finals even started. This time around, I'm very much indecisive. Let's see if anyone can Here make we go. The long gauge, wrong rage engage with the Jin comes in. They get the final chapter and the Crescent Guard. That's a lot of ultimates burned here. And 113 is still alive. You didn't even burn any summoners here from the side of K Corp. You are still seeing if you can make this 5v5 work. Cabo Shard is open to the Mega and he will lose that in the next five or six seconds. So, Carmine Corp are in an opportunity here where LDLC are going to be a little bit ham fisted to try and make something work. We will see the flash burn by Saking as he goes a little bit too far forward. Cabo Shard has to hop out because he knows he's about to go mini and the dragon can be started here by LDLC. That was actually a really high value chin trap. As soon as you get that slow on Saken, W's fly through the air. Oh, heck, got a flash out. And LDLC, they actually get to the objective first this time and they find they make it very hard for... Oh, gosh, that's damage. Oh, that's a lot of damage coming in there. But the heal, the flash, and the Gale Force used. And he's extra kick just keeps his life. Excluding what we just saw, that was a very beautiful fight from LDLC. And they kind of piloted their composition exactly how we wanted them to. It's not about finding any kills, but it's about making your opponent so low that they cannot fight. That's what they did. They're able to pick up the Drake. Yes, it's a little messy on the exit. But outside of that, that's how you want it to function. And you already picked up two Drakes. Oh, they're looking for oh, How's the flash? How's Mega coming? They've got Mega coming in, but he's not going to be able to use it in time. Just gets deleted because he has no magic resistance. Yeah, and you know what the uh, prime suspect is? There's an item down there. That hurts quite badly. It's been evolved at this point, and Ragnar, with that Muramana transform, we said it's going to be a problem when you reach those three items. Starting to get a little help to get to that point. And Keiko. Nothing else they can get on the map. They're only left to shop lanes right now. On the top side, you already broke the turret mid lane as well. You only really have to take this bot lane turret away, uh, uh, away from you. And it feels like that's been the game as well. You know, K-Cup, they've been very good at trimming out these turrets. There's still turrets to be taken from the side of LDLC. But when it comes to the skirmishes, that's where we see their crop flourish. And I feel like K-Cup, we see them on the rotations. We see them when they're pressuring people, when they're isolated. Um, and it's still going to be, once again, a tit-for-tit, tat-for-tat between these two teams. And I love the way you said that as well, the isolated members of the side of K-Corp, because you look at the deaths, if you consider this game. Yes, it's 1-5, and five, but four of those deaths are onto the NAR. Cabo Shard has been isolated because he has to be on the sideline. He has to de be the one to deal with the Jace. He's the only one who can tank the poke, and with the fleet footwork going in, trying, you know, heal it back up so it is going to be a lot more in him i still think he's having a decent game we obviously saw that solo kill that kind of brought it back up but it is still oh. going to be on him they get the flash in onto the cataclysm but with nowhere to go shut down goes over to reckless and that's the combination you guys mentioned it in champs like when this Jin doesn't have flash he's a sitting duck I and i pick. know it feels so bad to say oh you got to play safer and mid he's not even stood that far up it's just the nature of this comp it's the nature of that combo jarvan has this access you have that bullet time to just Really punish them. Next, he has no help in that situation. Oh, oh, teleport. They're gonna go for something here. They do have a flash and a ultimate here from Cabo. Can he look for something? Not before he goes into the mini. But now, oh, Seiken so goes in, gets them scooped and booped. I could try to get away from this, oh. but Hantera is heat seeking. He knows which one you are, and he's going to find you now. It's onto Ragnar, who needs to try and stop this Baron. And when you reach the big stages, the big players respond, and it's Saken with the godlike shuffle. But this might not be the Baron. There's no, no smite available. 113 is dead. They have to secure it. You have to shock blast as well. That's a lot of Curtain damage. Call. And no one's cleared the warden yet. There he finally goes through. Curtain, Curtain call. call. No, no, They're no, going to no, go don't for it. He's going to try and make it. The burst comes in. Going to get the last oh. one. Pantera! What get hero. down, Mr. President! He sacrifices his life so that the benefit of the team can get the Baron. Live on for me. Live on without me. Go on. Win this game. Take the Baron. I'll gladly sacrifice my life for it. Hentara, monstrous performance once again on the Rakan.
Not that just someone else could have blocked it for him, but he sees that bullet through, flying through the air and he takes the decision to at least secure that one. And it gets so close. And the engage range from Kami Corp becoming such a problem for LDLC. Again, they don't have the Jin here. They don't have <gasps> that. They don't have that champion which can help them in the longer range fights. Maybe slow someone down. Maybe put some traps down. Hit a W and Saken pounces. And Antara, you know, so quick with that quickness as well, getting over the wall or with the grand entrance there. It's in the name. It really is. And then Ragnar, I mean, they're left to try and poke out the Baron away. I really would have loved to see Antara die again, but it seems like Dyke, he's got other plans for this one. They've got other plans because 113 is coming in here and he's oh, got some friends here. as well. It's going to be a 4 5 v 5 The TP is going to be coming in. They're going to get taken, jumping in on top of it. The bullet time is good. Exit King is no longer part of this team fight. As you can see, Kabushar taking out Yike as well. It's a two for nothing. They will trade it back. You can see Ike trying to make something work for Karma. Army Corp are just wiping the floor with LDLC. They see fight, they take fight, and they take advantage. And they have themselves power spikes, and they are being so decisive about using them. This isn't just seeing every fight and taking it. They're also seeing the right fights, too. They can end the game. I don't know if they can end the game, but they can get so much off of this right now. Look at all the wave states. Top, mid, bot. They're all being pushed in by the side of Carmen Corp's minions. So you have so many options available to you. Thank you so much, Goldberg, because... You didn't set up anything as LDLC. You went back to try and find something and it just backfired. And it felt like they realized they were caught out and they just had to all in. They said, like, we're, we're going to go towards these teleports. Let's see if we can take a fight. But it isn't the kind of fight that they want. It feels like LDLC were the ones getting a bit desperate there. They took a multi-angle fight. The Yumi can't help with that. The Jin's not peeled for. Everything goes wrong for them. And LDLC's composition, it is the harder composition to pilot as well. Like, if you make so. one, make, we, we said this the entire game so far. One misstep, you die. And that's why I hate it as well at times is because like you have human error you had times where it will falter and you know in the late game where you get a standoff so many times around the baron or around the elder drake as we've seen already so many times in this series one guy will make a mistake or one guy will falter to the mobility coming through from the engage of either hantara Sagan, Cabochard. it's just so difficult to deal with of a uh, in, in kcom's composition cabo has the mega has flash looking for something he's gonna go try and find yike but he gets himself out with the crescent guard so that just kind of stops your defense now in the mid lane the base shall be broken open. This Baron power play above five and a half thousand. This is becoming a monster snowball running down to the chalets and it's going to destroy everything. And just a reminder, Carmen Corp couldn't even get a single game off of LDLC in their LFL playoffs. They went 0-3 against them in their own series versus them. And then they couldn't even get to reface them in the finals. They were taken down in that lower bracket. They get one more chance to take them down on that even bigger stage, and they are flourishing right now. Even talking to Saken just a couple days ago, you know, he was talking about, like, facing LDLC again. He was pretty sure that not only as a team, they had evolved themselves, but they only they also had a really good read on what LDLC wants to do. This time around, with kind of this team fighting coming through, this kind of evolution of them that we saw against Vitality B as well, with the Asir for Saken, the long-range carry, it's really just worked wonders on them, and it just keeps, you know, speaking that story as well when we watch to play. This is just them pushing forward. Like, how do you get rid of this? You have to invest a curtain call to try and make this one work for your team. Antera will get rooted up. We'll have the quickness, and they're using an awful lot to try and kill off a Rakan right now. This isn't really going to work out for you because when the Crescent Guard goes down, you're going to be forced to flash away. I like the idea from LDLC, but like you guys said earlier, it's a little bit desperate. And a lot of it might have been wondering whether they could get a chase recalling, getting out with the home guards to get towards that fight. They had to say themselves a very risky 1v1 there, which is starting to go, well, not even starting, it's continuing to go a little bit poorly for Ragnar. Not able to really punish Kabashar when he's in Meganar's state. And now Kabashar starting to put the hurt down even more in a lane, which he died four times early in. For Carmine Corp, this is your game to lose. So where do you want to see these guys go, Goldberg? How do you want to see them finish off this game? Because there's something that we have to give a little bit of criticism to the Carmine Corp. They can get a little bit fun in their later stages if they feel like they're ahead. I feel like at this point, you can open up the map if you want to. There's one minute for the for the Baron, right? Cabochard, he's got that teleport. You keep him in the bottom side. You can have one member in the mid lane to escort these uh, super minions in, apply the extra pressure to the side of LDLC, and then you just group around the top side. So it's really easy to just back and default on towards the Baron afterwards. I also feel like 113 can just sit there and look to blow flashes. Just look to take away summoner spells. Look to take away crescent guards because you're at the point now 
now, where this Jarvan oh, is really tanky. It's not easy to turn it immediately around onto this guy. If you were going to, if you were further behind, maybe the Jarvan gets popped. Not the case. One, one, three. I want to see him get, make some of those more risky plays. Try and take away some summoners. I love how they've kept those two pink wards yeah, in know, that right? brush. They've just been like, no. Send a message. We know <laughs> that we have. They have no vision here, and we can play around. And honestly, it's exactly what they're doing. Like you said, one, one, three is playing to blow flashes. He's just sitting in the fog of war, saying, "You can't see me," which means you have to stay in your base. To be fair, that's an incredibly annoying bush. If you place a pink ward on the left side, then the far right yeah. side of the <laughs> bush will actually not reveal the wards. But fights happening. Here we go. We're gonna try and see them go for this one here. They do get the cataclysm out. Kavashar is TPing in. As the curtain call comes out, Kavashar goes into Mega. They still need to take down this turret, and they will do so. So, second inhibitor turret has been taken. There is one inhibitor down, another one exposed. You have the Shreema's legacy to back you up here as Carmine Corp. You can't get too frisky with this one here. They need to make sure that they don't give any opportunities left over to LDLC, and they're going to back away. But they still have such a margin of error to work with. The Jin is not doing much damage. I mean, Jin is not a high damage AD carry as far as they go, scaling to the late game. The LeBlanc has to deal with an Anathema's chain on the other side, reducing a lot of the damage, a lot of tanks. You really are waiting on Shock Blast, but the Jace is even held in a side lane. LDLC, so few options. And can we just prove a point while the resets are coming through? What's the goal discrepancy between these two AD carries? I'd really love to see that as well, just to really put into perspective of how Ooh. difficult the matchup is. Oh yeah. my I mean, god! That's what you get for blind picking Jin and Yumi. I'm honestly not even sad about it because <laughs> it's so unplayable <laughs> when you pick it into a misfortune that you know Reckless love playing as well. And I think. That could have been way worse as well. K-Cop didn't even play around this lane, but now in the team fights, it's such a weak point that's so easy to attack. And what did you get for that blind pick? You got a counter pick in top lane, which is even in gold. You started off well, that's not really led to anything after this point. And now you look Abo. at Kavashar, he's so aggressive. He has to be because he knows how strong he can be. They are going to get a little bit of damage down, but Hantera can join in. The bullet time is good. Ike gets onto the backside. Hantera just about stays alive. Yike, however, is not so lucky. And Kavashar sees that all the ultimates oh! are gone. And Saken, once again, sweeps up the competition, and Carmine Corp can't put a foot wrong. Higher in editor, he's already made multiple montages playing this one specifically, and now they could just look for the end. 31 minutes into the game, finally with a mid lane wave coming in here. It's a cannon wave, no supers, but they should have it in them. And Carmine Corp looking to take a lead, undefeated till this point. Carmine Corp looking to take a second. One more step to a historic three-peat of Amazon EU Masters Championships. <sighs> Carmine Corp, they're just getting better and better. I mean,